Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, it's Candace. Okay, good. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. So far, I'm counting six members, uh, Amber Prince, Candace Williams, Dale Woolridge, Josh Gaither, Michelle Guadnola, Paul Dabrowski, and I need 13. Are there any other members on? Melissa Moyer is here. And Carrie Lewis is here, too. And Rebecca Haro is here. All right, that's nine. So Shelly, do you want to give it until about 9.05 to get a few more people and then we'll uh, see what we have? Yeah, that sounds like a good idea. After All right. We'll plan on starting at 9.05 <laughs> then. All right. Julia, will you adjust the recorder, please? Hi, Shelly. I just wanted to make sure that you could hear us. I can hear you, Julia. Hear you, Julia. Perfect. Thank you. I need some game show.
old music. <laughs> so people don't think uh, we're in a black hole here. <laughs> well, Shelly, you do have your phone with you, don't you? <laughs> you want me to play your walk-in music, Ethan? <laughs> Got ten. I need three more. Three more. Minutes. Garth Gamer on the phone. All right. Ray Pro on the phone. All right. Jim Cecilini on the Jay phone. Jay Cunningham on, on the call. Danielle Stella is on the phone. Thank you. All right. We can start. Uh, before 905 if you like dr. Gaither okay sounds good um, thank you everybody for attending uh, this is dr. Josh Gaither um, let's go ahead and call this meeting to order uh, Shelly can you please do roll call Amber Prince here, here. Candace Williams present Carrie Lewis I'm uh, present. Corbin. Sorry. Oh, thank you. Corbin King. Dale Woolridge. Here. Danielle Stella. I'm here. Garth Gamer. Present. Jeff Valentine. Heather Miller. James Cunningham. Is that James Cecilini here? Yes. Yeah, James Cunningham. Present. Joshua Gaither. Here. Julie Augenstein. Laura Smith. Have to hit star. Melissa Meyer here. Pam Nolan. Pam Goslar. Paul Debrasky. Ralph Kelly. Ray Proa. Rebecca Harrow. I'm present. Sean Boker. Tiffany Strever. And Tom Flanagan. I count 13, we do have quorum. Okay, thank you, Shelly. Um, let's go ahead and start with a few announcements. Um, as we are all very accustomed now to meetings, a few reminders for online meeting etiquette. Uh, to speak, please hover your mouse or touch the screen. You will see buttons at the bottom of your screen uh, to mute and unmute yourself. Uh, we do have a significant amount of background noise. Uh, please be considerate of everyone on the call and keep yourself muted unless speaking. Uh, attendees are advised that this is a public meeting and is being recorded and will be posted on the ADHS website. Anything said verbally, anything viewed via webcam, or anything tape, typed in the chat box will become part of the recording that is posted. 
again, if you are attending uh, electronically, use the mute button. If you are attending by phone, press star six to unmute yourself. Shelly will be displaying materials for the entire group, so there is no need to present your screen or share your screen. Shelly and Julia will monitor the chat box for any questions. Uh, and for everyone's benefit, please do identify yourself by your full name before uh, any statements or remarks are made so that we can give you credit for those in the minutes. Uh, with those announcements, uh, let's turn to the first agenda item, uh, the chairman's report. Um, so as normal, a friendly reminder for everyone that is there, if you miss two consecutive meetings, uh, the Bureau will contact you and ask you if you are still interested in serving on the committee. Uh, please note the attendance report is attached to this agenda. Take a peek at that. Um, and if you have missed several meetings, please do what you can to attend. At uh, this meeting, there are no new members and one upcoming vacancy to report. Uh, vacancy is for pre-hospital EMS coordinator in the uh, Ames region. Um, uh, with that, uh, I think that is all that I have for uh, chairman's report. Um, I'd like to turn it over to the Bureau uh, for the Bureau reports. Uh, Julie, I believe you are first. Good morning. Um, not a ton to report for EMS for Children. Um, however, we did get our results back from um, the National EMS data collection that we did earlier in the year. So that was January through March and have our um, report. So just a couple of quick updates based on that. Um, we had 101 agencies as our total for our denominator. And in terms of um, emergency medical services for children performance measure two, the pediatric emergency care coordinator, um, 37 out of 101 agencies said that yes, they do have a pediatric emergency care coordinator. And then in terms of the use of pediatric specific equipment, 28 out of 101, or 27.7% of agencies met the requirement for that. So um, stay tuned over coming months. We'll be um, able to share that data a little bit more fully. If you have any questions or want more information, feel free to reach out. Um, and then in terms of the National Pediatric Readiness Assessment, that data collection for hospitals was supposed to originally occur in June. That has been postponed. So um, also stay tuned for that. That's all I have. Thank you, Julia. Uh, Mr. Mullins is our. Uh, good morning, That's everybody. Good morning. I'll just uh, share real quickly that our work to create a draft version of the CON rules. That's the Article Nine rules revision is uh, moving forward and we anticipate sharing the first draft sometime in August, probably towards the end of August. Uh, we had hoped to get it out earlier in July, but we're probably just not going to make that, uh, although we're still trying. That draft document will then be open for comments from stakeholders across the state and it will be based on the comments that we've received from stakeholders. So uh, stand by for that. Otherwise, many of my staff are working in efforts to ensure that the EMS and trauma community has the support they need during COVID-19. And so if you have any needs or questions or would like to uh, make suggestions to the Bureau, please feel free to reach out to any of our staff and uh, we'll do everything we can to support folks during that time. That's the end of my report, Dr. Griffiths. Thank you, Terry. Uh, we certainly appreciate all of the Bureau's hard work during this very difficult time. Um, let's turn now to our uh, official agenda items for the day. Uh, first, let's turn to approval of our meeting minutes. Can I have a motion to Discuss approval. Uh, 
I make approval for that. I'll second Candace Williams. Okay, thank you. We have a um, motion to discuss the meeting minutes. If everyone can please review the last meeting minutes and uh, identify anything that might need to be change changed. Hearing no suggestions for changes to the minutes, can I have a vote to approve the meeting minutes as written? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none opposed, the motion passes. Uh, please list the minutes as approved. Moving on to the second agenda item, uh, we would like to discuss the sequence of discretionary reports. Please see attach the attachment to the agenda to today's meeting for the current list of recommended reports. Um, can I have a motion to discuss the sequencing of recommended uh, bureau reports? Make a motion to discuss. Okay, can I have a second? Candace Williams, second. Thank you very much. Um, if you will all then turn to the attachment, you will see the uh, several suggestions for possible discretionary reports to be considered for, to considered by the Bureau. Um, uh, does anyone have suggestions for reordering or additions to this list? Dr. Gaither, this is Terry Mullins. I would just like to uh, speak to the importance of, of all of these reports, but particularly the first report. There are uh, data coming out uh, nationally that the opioid crisis is in full swing and in fact increasing. And we've had some preliminary data at the department that we're looking at, although it's not uh, definitive yet we're doing some additional work on it. Uh, it appears that this is you know, opioid overdoses remain a significant public health issue in Arizona. And so this uh, this topic would be something that would be a good uh, evaluation uh, as part of that uh, Arizona's ongoing effort. Yes, thank you for that, Terry. Uh, I do wholeheartedly agree. Um, just to add some additional color to that statement, at least for our region, we recently took a look at uh, opiate overdoses um, and the association between opiate overdoses and the COVID epidemic. Uh, we did not find a significant increase in the rate of opiate overdoses locally uh, however, we did find a significant increase in the rate of refusals following opiate overdoses. Um, we are trying to publish that data now, uh, and I do agree with your statement, Terry. This is a an emerging public health emergency uh, set on top of, obviously, the big picture of the COVID epidemic. Any other suggestions or comments? I, this uh, meeting format is obviously very difficult. I don't want to, uh, I'm going to purposely give longer pauses than may be comfortable for many. So uh, please feel free to speak up. Uh, I do have one possible suggestion for an item to be added to this list related to the COVID epidemic. Uh, 
Um, as you know, uh, the Bureau has uh, released several COVID guidelines for uh, recommendations for patient care. Uh, those recommendations are primarily uh, seem to be targeted at improving EMS provider safety. Um, so one uh, discretionary report that I would like to add to this list or propose adding to this list uh, would be an item uh, such as um, evaluate the uh, effect of implementing a COVID-19 EMS administration administrative guideline on uh, the practices in the field. Um, and uh, I know that's poorly worded, uh, but let me explain what I'm thinking about uh, to some extent. Um, uh, the COVID-19 guideline uh, really does uh, recommend limiting oxygen administration, uh, limiting endotracheal intubation, um, and uh, limiting CPAP and BiPAP, as well as limiting uh, albuterol. Uh, so from a simple quality improvement um, perspective, I would be very curious to see if implementation of that guideline or publication of that guideline was associated with a decrease in rates of intubation, CPAP use, and albuterol administration among patients with a primary or secondary impression of COVID-19. Uh, thoughts on that topic from the group? Dr. Gaither, uh, this is Ray Pro. Uh, um, where were where were you looking to add, add that in there as far as on the uh, list? You know, I think um, I would obviously, because it is timely, put it higher up on the list, um, probably as number one or two, um, only because obviously it is a um, issue that uh, is uh, poignant at this moment and uh, in six months may not be. Thanks, Gail. Can you hear me okay? So I definitely think the opioid should say it's a top priority. I think we're seeing a big increase in some of the data we uh, preliminarily have pulled. Uh, also seeing a lot of national data on the increase in both behavioral health complaints and opioid overdoses uh, as COVID numbers have increased. And I do like the idea of kind of looking at overall patient outcomes as it relates to the implementation of the COVID uh, guidelines for EMS. I agree, this is Ray Pro. Um, I don't have any problem with putting it in number two spot. So then can I ask for a motion to add a topic to this list? And that topic would be something to the effect of evaluate the effectiveness and safety of the COVID-19 guideline. This is Ray Pro. I make a motion to accept uh, Dr. Gaither's uh, uh, suggestion and place it, I don't know if you want me to say the whole thing, but uh, place it in the number two slot. Thank you. Uh, can I have a second? Rebecca Hara will second that motion. Oh, sorry, I was in, on mute. My bad. Uh, so I have a motion to uh, modify the current list uh, to include a COVID-19 topic, uh, moving everything else down in orders. Any other recommended changes before we vote on this uh, agenda item?
Okay, hearing none, um, all those in favor of this change, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say nay. Hearing none opposed, the item passes. Let's then move on to the next agenda item. Uh, the next agenda item is, sorry, I have to get to the right place in the notes here. Um, to discuss the cactus data for Q3 and 4. Can I have a motion to discuss this agenda item? This is Ray Pro. I make a motion to go ahead and uh, look at the data. Thank you, Ray. Can I have a second? This is Dale Woolridge. I'll second that. Thank you, Dale. Let's then begin the discussion. I would like to ask that someone from the Bureau, either Vatzel or Shelley, uh, first start by giving us an overview of the data that is in front of us. I will defer no, to the or Anne. <laughs> oh, I, I can talk about it. This is what's up. Good morning, everyone. So this, is, uh, this report is exactly the same report we uh, published for the quarter of uh, three and four. Is, Kelly, can I see the date, please? Go to the first page. Um, we, it, it's the same report, quarter three and four, 2019. Um, we also have another report, quarter one and two for 2020. And this is no a report different than what we talked last time. It's a, um, if not, we can go down that, go below now, Shelly. Yeah. Still below. So core data element, and at the end of the core data element, it tells us, let's go below. Yeah. Yeah. So person met data completion standard is equal to 82%. So we have identified the core data elements that are 62. Then we have a spe special sensitive illness. And then it shows us the person met data completion. At present, basically where we are statewide, okay, and code 82% of the data elements submitted to the state is complete. Uh, and so each of the time sensitive illness also will show us the data completion standards for us to determine, okay, where from here, where we want to read in future. So that, that's the report is about. Thank you, Vatzel. Um, that's very helpful. Um, let me start this discussion by giving the group a small reminder of um, the big picture of this data um, and perhaps some direction for the discussion today. Uh, as you all remember, the Cactus data set is primarily a quality improvement data set. Um, the idea is to provide quality improvement data back to EMS agencies, uh, targeting particularly those time sensitive uh, illnesses. Um, what we are looking to at today is obviously not the quality improvement uh, benchmarks or performance, but the quality of that data. Historically, we have struggled with data completeness and that has made this data set somewhat less useful. Uh, at our last meeting, we did discuss uh, at what thresholds or how much data completeness should be required uh, for an agency to maintain their uh, PEEP status, Premier EMS Agency status. Um, today, I wanted to review this uh, report um, in somewhat of a... Uh, line by line fashion now that we have some information on data completeness and discuss if there are any changes or recommendations we would like to make to EMS Council 
regarding the data completeness component uh, of this data set. Um, so if you will all indulge me by um, either having Shelly, you turn to the uh, data completeness report or pull it up yourself, um, and we will go through the elements and look at completeness uh, and make any recommendations regarding um, items that uh, seem a little off. Uh, any questions or concerns about that? Okay, so, um, and so let's first uh, turn to the core data elements. Um, so this is an area in which we have uh, amazingly good completeness. Um, as you can see here, um, almost all of these are above a 90% completeness rate um, with the exception of possible injury, um, primary symptom, provider's secondary impression, uh, current medications, medication allergies, uh, and response to procedures, as well as airway device at tidal CO2 placement. Uh, there then is a couple further down, uh, pulse oximetry that falls at 85%. Um, this, in this area, there seems to be fairly good data completeness. Uh, the percent that met data completion standards, as you can see at the very bottom, is 82%. Um, so one of the thoughts that I had looking at this um, that I wanted to get some other opinions about is it's striking to me that there are some data points included in this set currently that are very important to include, yet we would not expect a high data completeness. Um, I think one of the best examples of this is secondary impression. Um, uh, it's not surprising to me that only 30% of providers listed a secondary impression. A uh, patient with chest pain is unlikely to have a secondary impression. Uh, so I wanted to start with some discussion regarding should we recommend that some data points have be eliminated from the data completeness um, uh, because they are unlikely to be completed, but retained as a component of the Cactus data set. So this is Gail. I think Josh brings up a good point in regards to some of the issues. When we look at things like secondary impression, uh, there's some entities where this is really important, such as cardiac arrest. If we can get a secondary impression as to the presumed cause of cardiac arrest, it's a very important measure. Uh, then if you compare that to other things as chest pain, or head injury, that may not be as big of an issue. Uh, so I think that is some of the struggle when we look at some of these data elements. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Any other thoughts or suggestions? Hey, Dr. Gaither, it's James Cunningham. So with respect to the secondary impressions, I mean, do we, at least, you know, from the, uh, from the providers and the agencies out there, is that something that has been a big concern for them as an individual agency, or are we going to ask them to, um, you know, to add another layer of requirements that they haven't previously had? Thank you, James, for that question. Let me provide a little bit, uh, maybe more background that will help. Uh, so I think the concerns surrounding this report 
is that if an agency does not achieve whatever it is, 50% data completeness, they would be removed from a premier EMS agency status. Um, so I think that is a really important reason to look at this. And as you say, get some uh, feedback from providers. Um, I don't know if agencies require a secondary impression, for example, uh, to close out a report. Um, I am afraid that if we did require a secondary impression uh, as a report closeout rule uh, to get a data completeness threshold, that would very much skew our data towards random secondary impressions. Dr. Gaither, this is uh, Ray Proa. I just want to notice that, uh, um, yeah, the secondary impression, I could say my, uh, it's not a mandatory in my fields, I believe, for our EPCR. And it's something that I also uh, kind of struggle in as a department to have the guys put in. And uh, just because uh, it seems like uh, on the basic calls, you may get it filled in, but like a lot of this stuff, like the STEMI stroke things, um, and then the things where it's a, it's a obvious what the chief complaint is, you, it just doesn't get filled in, so. Thank you for the comment. Um, I, I do have a question for the Bureau staff, um, uh, just to make sure I am tracking correctly. Uh, the items listed here and the completeness, um, those are all the items you are looking for in the Cactus data set, correct? There aren't things that are not on this list. There, there are few data elements not on the list which are in the characters, but the reason because they are not on the list is we are not able to calculate them. You know, it's it's logically, mathematically not possible to calculate the score, and hence it's not included. Right. Got it. So um, I, I think just to clarify what my proposal would be, um, would be to uh, not report completeness on several of these measures to allow EMS agencies to better comply with this completeness matrix without skewing data in a way that could misrepresent um, the, um, the actual data. Um, I think uh, if there's not a lot more discussion on this, I, I realize this is a very difficult um, format in which to have a discussion over very technical um, topics. Um, I think my proposal would be um, to strike. Uh, so in this report, my proposal would be to identify elements that we do not expect to have completeness reports calculated. So for example, uh, in this core data elements table, item number 32, provider's secondary impression, there would simply be a dash through completeness as this element is not um, relevant, or we do not recommend that we have a high completeness level for that data point. Um, is there anyone that's opposed to that? Josh, if, if this is Dale, if, if I could, uh, before we continue, just clarify, the, the impact on premier status. So it, I understood you correctly. Each agency is vulnerable to lose their premier status if they're not 100% in compliance with all of these data fields um, and or is there some degree of an allowances? I think if, 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 if it is that, that severe requirement, I, I'm, I'm totally behind the concept of allowing um, some fields to not necessarily be 100% compliant versus, you know, like a medica medication list. Um, 
uh, w was one of the fields. I mean, sometimes that's not available. So one of the fields might be not available and th therefore it's filled in because the list wasn't available. Um, but if you could just clarify the impact, if you would, thank you. Yes, and I will defer to Mr. Mullins, but I will give you my brief understanding. Um, so the discussion about requiring premier EMS agencies to have a percentage complete of all these fields in order to maintain premier EMS status has been going on for the last, I believe, six to nine months. And ultimately, that decision uh, rests with EMS Council to decide uh, what threshold they would like to identify and whether they would like to require uh, this to uh, maintain Premier EMS uh, agency status. Uh, Mr. Mullins, is that correct? <clears throat> that is the methodology that we propose to EMS Council um, you know, just short of two years ago, and they approved that. <clears throat> what, what has never been approved is what that benchmark score would be. And in the last EMS Council meeting, and I believe it was March, but Honestly, I've lost kind of track of my calendar the last six months as everybody else has. They did not take action on establishing a minimum score. And I think, <clears throat> I think that may be a reflection. Just, I'm, I'm just making a supposition that may be a reflection on that EMS Council may be reconsidering, uh, may be reconsidering that uh, idea of having a minimum score uh, as part of the Premier EMS Agency uh, maintaining status of uh, Premier EMS Agency. But, but we haven't confirmed that with the EMS Council. Um, so I think that answers uh, your question, Dr. Gaither. I actually had one additional question for you, Dr. Gaither, just so that I understand what your what your suggestion is. In the specifically the secondary provider secondary impression element number thirty two, you're requesting that it not be uh, reported in with a with number. But I wonder if, or, or are you suggesting that it just not be included in the score that an agency still reported, but just not used as part of the scoring? Can you? Correct. Uh, it's the, the latter. So my proposal would be that should EMS Council adopt this system of you must have 80% data completeness to maintain PEEP status, that we identify a subset of the CACTUS data points that would contribute to that score. And non-contributing okay. items obviously would be left off of the completeness score, but remain in the CACTUS data set. Uh, for example, secondary impression. And I'm gonna ask one additional clarifying question and I'll stop. Uh, so you would, it, you know, in the in future versions of this report, you would just prefer that it not be included in the document. Yes, or and included not, in the document, but not the percent report, or I'm sorry, the percent complete not reported, simply listed as a dash. Okay. Got it. Thank you. This, this is Gail. So uh, just to answer Dale's question in regards to medication, so, one of the jobs that uh, Botzel and her team spend a lot of time working on is making sure that there are options that would count. So for medication list, which is a really good example, 
I, there are options that count that, you, that suffice that you've answered the question. So if it's not available or unknown, there's certain drop down fields that an EMS provider can choose that would satisfy answering that question. Uh, so just wanted to make sure that, especially when you look at some of these variables, there is a manner that you could still answer that and get credit, even if the data was not available to you. This is Dale. Uh, thank you. That helps. Um, in general, data sets are most beneficial if they are complete. Um, if there's uh, fields that go unfilled, you lose the value to the data set. Um, I just, without understanding the impact and the ramifications and how many agencies are vulnerable, it's hard for me to really say, although that being said, you want to encourage the outliers. Um, uh, but having a having a field, uh, as Gail had illustrated, that allows the EMS provider to to place something in that box. You know, for example, race. Some sometimes you're not able to determine. Um, so having an un, unable to determine option um, might be able to allow the field to be completed um, without um, being too onerous on the EMS provider. My two cents. Thank you. Thank you, Dale. That's uh, it is a, a very good point. Um, without good data completeness, the data set becomes much less useful. Um, any other thoughts or comments on this agenda item? Josh, this is Rebecca Harrow. Uh, it was only one individual at EMS Council that recommended this be tabled, and this individual has done this two years in a row. Um, I believe the rest of EMS Council supports this. We know that Tepi was tasked with raising the bar higher, and that's what our goal was. If we're never going to raise the bar higher, how can we expect agencies to strive to get better scores? or incorporate in their training what they need to be able to get those better scores. I don't see a valid argument here when we do have those null options when the information is completely unavailable. That's just my comment. Thank you. Thank you very much for that comment. Any other comments, suggestions, thoughts? So if I can, uh, I'd like to just summarize the discussion perhaps um, and uh, suggest a way to um, bring a little bit of closure to this discussion. Um, it appears that EMS Council needs to make a decision on uh, if they're going to use data completeness to, uh, to in any way... Um, uh, drive uh, premier EMS agency status or retaining that status. Uh, should they decide to do that, there may be items on this list which are not reflective of an EMS agency's true completeness. And we would recommend to EMS Council that if they adopt this, that we would on a regular basis evaluate the data points that contribute to the completeness score. Does that sound like an effective or a, a, a good summary of the discussion? I don't think we need to make a motion or anything else on this item. This is Rebecca again. I support that. Thank you. This is Ray Pro. I support that as well. Okay, thank you all. Um, let's then move to the next agenda item. Uh, the next agenda item is to discuss bylaws, reviews, and roster roles. Uh, please turn in your minutes, if you're following separately, to the bylaws. And I would like to ask that the Bureau give us um, a brief overview of these and any recommended changes or topics that need to be discussed.
Hello, this is Gail. Uh, so one of the things that we would like to do, and I think maybe starting uh, with the roster, so uh, the stat just to kind of give a little bit of background, these statutory committees, uh, the actual makeup of those committees is delineated uh, in statute, and so we can't necessarily adjust those. With the standing committees, we do have a little bit more flexibility. Uh, we wanted to make sure that all the regions were kind of represented equally, uh, and then also wanted to look and see and ensure that we had adequate representation from the different groups we felt needed uh, to be present as part of the TEPI committee. So one of the challenges that we've had is that some of the positions, uh, if you look at the roster, are listed with two regions. And so it becomes almost a competition, <laughs> which is somewhat challenging in terms of making sure that uh, we want to make sure that each region is adequately present, uh, represented. And if someone decides that they no longer want to participate, and they're in that two region selection, we have to kind of go back and forth and figure out which region uh, people were correlated to. So that was kind of the first question for the group is, uh, does the group feel comfortable potentially adjusting the roster to allow for two representatives to be elected from each region uh, so that it's very clear if someone changes roles or moves or steps down uh, that we don't have to try to do the back and forth of which region would this position go to and it would be more clearly go, you know, if it's a SAMES individual that steps down, then we know that's the SAMES position that needs to be replaced, uh, et cetera. So that was just kind of the first conversation piece. Uh, one of the things that may occur if we do ch go in that route is that uh, we may end up having to ask someone if we have three members from a region to see if one of those three members is willing to step down or interested in stepping down. Uh, so that is just something to consider as we uh, look at the roster. So I'll just start the discussion with that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Any comments on the uh, uh, representation and evening that out from regions? So perhaps while everyone thinks about this a little bit, um, I do have one question about this. Um, we do sometimes struggle, uh, particularly for this first meeting of the morning to reach quorum. Um, do, does the Bureau feel that this would affect our ability to reach quorum in any way? This is Gail, I don't think so. I think really the main issue is uh, kind of filling roles. One of the challenges uh, is because this is a large committee, we obviously need a much larger number of people to participate. Um, with remote meetings, I think hopefully it will be a little bit easier to maintain quorum moving forward. So I don't think changing to just making it very clear. Uh, I think our biggest challenge has really been figuring out who to replace openings with when they've come up and kind of keeping that equal representation. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Any other questions about the representation? So can I, and this is not a formal vote, um, however, because we're meeting remotely and it can be difficult to get a feel for uh, members' opinion on this, can I get a just uh, word of support or uh, word of non-support from each of the committee members for uh, equal representation from the regions. You want me to go down the roster? Uh, no, I, I just wanted people to take themselves off mute for two minutes just to say, yes, I support it, or no, I don't support this. This is Candace Williams, I support. Thank you, Candace. Rebecca Haro, support. Thank you, Rebecca. Ray Pro, I support. Thank you, Ray. Amber Prince, I support. This is Laura Smith, I support. Thanks to both of you. Deal with I support. Thank you, and I see Dr. Dabrowski supports also in the notes. Thank you all. 
Um, so hearing the vast majority in support of that concept, uh, Dr. Bradley or Mr. Mullins, would you like to discuss any other items for uh, change on the uh, rule or the committee bylaws? Mr. Terry, I don't have any specific uh, uh, discussion for them, but would hope that folks have had a chance to review and analyze the uh, the edits. Um, I don't see that we have a strike uh, change version available, so I can't uh, speak specifically to them. If anybody on the phone is more aware of these specific changes, go ahead and speak up. So this is Gail. One of the things, this is not an action item for today, so this was really just to start the discussion. Uh, we typically have a little bit of time in this meeting, so uh, what we can do is definitely bring a proposed final version uh, for the next meeting as a discussion and action item. Uh, we just have to update these by the end of the year, so I think we still have time. Uh, that's why we left it as more of an open discussion item for today. So. Uh, hopefully this will at least get people to start looking through the uh, bylaws. We will work behind the scenes uh, with the regions and the representatives from the regions to see about equaling that uh, roster and then bring forward a proposed roster at the next meeting for approval as well. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. For the committee members, any other thoughts or comments regarding the bylaws or revisions? This is Candace Williams. I don't have any. Thanks, Candace. <clears throat> okay, hearing uh, no other comments, um, we will move on to the next agenda item. Uh, I'm sorry, that actually ends the discussion and action items for this meeting. Let's move on to the updates. Can I please have an update from the TRUG uh, Trauma Registry Users Group? Hi, good morning, everybody. This is Melissa Moyer. Can you hear me okay? Melissa, I think you're going to have some really bad feedback. I don't know if you're calling in on a phone. And a is that better? Uh, yes, that is better. Thank you. Sorry, this is being challenging. Can you hear me okay now? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Hi, this is Melissa Moyer. Um, not really too much to report other than I'm sure all of the registers are running the idea with working remotely. I just want everybody to be mindful of the deadlines for the entities that you are downloading your data to. State's second quarter data was due by July 1st, and the um, next quarter call for data will be October 1st. If you submit any data to NTDB or to TQIP, check their websites for the most up-to-date call for data. Lancet is or has made the transition with the ESO. Personally, I have not had any issues with anything, but I have heard some rumors of lack of responses from Garrett on certain requests. So with that being said, always remember that a work order ticket is your best way to have anything taken care of. That way it is recorded with um, the date that it's requested. Other than that, just remember to stay healthy. And while you're working at home, get up and stretch and everybody stay safe out there. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, let's go ahead and then move Melissa, on to the trauma program the trauma manager program workshops. Manager. Heather, do you have an update for us? Yeah. Melissa, I can't hear you speaking. Are you still speaking? No, I am finished. Thank you. Hi, can you guys hear me now? Yes, Heather, we can hear you now. Sorry, technical difficulties. So the last trauma program manager's meeting got uh, canceled and then moved and then moved a second time. Um, so they were trying to do it online. We didn't have any really big updates that I know of from that meeting um, because they were having difficulties even this trying to- This is we may have lost audio schedule. in the room. Can you guys hear me okay? 
Yes, Dr. Bradley, we can hear you. So there's no real update, Josh, sorry. From no Storm problem. Program Managers. Thank you, I appreciate that. That makes it easy. Um, let's then move on to the EMS Registry Users Group, EMS Run. Uh, Ray, do you have an update for us? Yeah, Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Gaither, we have, uh, I believe the EMS RUG meeting has, they haven't had a meeting since February, so since uh, the previous um, FEPI meeting we had. Um, the next one is scheduled in September, a uh, date to be determined at this time. I'm sure Anna will let us all know when it's called, I plan on attending it. And then uh, she just wanted to kind of reiterate that EMS agencies uh, need to check their bureau uh, report portals for the latest CACTUS uh, data completeness report. It's, uh, I guess they're able to see that and very few people have checked them. Um, and then also, like you said, the, the next, um, if you're having issues with your uh, submitting, you're getting a lot of things uh, kicked back, um, be sure to uh, check with your provider if you're using whoever your EPCR provider Gosh, is. Because, can you uh, hear me okay? Uh, yes, Dr. Bradley, we can hear you. For uh, department, uh, sir. Ray, can we take a pause real quick? I just want to make sure that the bureau staff uh, are still on the call, can hear us, and are able to record. Yes, I think we are back up here. Sorry, we lost internet connection briefly. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, Ray, go ahead and let's continue with your uh, EMS rug report. Yeah, no problem. Um, and then just for the people that are reporting to check with their EPCR providers to make sure uh, the data that they're getting some, you know, is getting submitted and to make sure if you have any reports or anything I'm going to get back to you, uh, you have up until September 1st to make sure to resubmit them to make sure we get those data, all that data set complete. So that's all I have. All right. Thank you very much, Ray. Um, Moving on, next we have agenda items to be considered for the next meeting. Would anyone like to offer up agenda items? Okay, hearing none, I'd like to make a call to the public. Okay, hearing none, no responses for the call to the public. Uh, let's briefly go over upcoming events. Uh, the Pediatric Care After Resuscitation course is online, November 17th through the 18th. Uh, you can visit the Bureau's news and conference page for upcoming events. Um, with that, the next meeting will be November 19th at 9 a.m. Uh, and can I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? This is Ray Pro. I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Ray. Second. This is Dale. Make it. All right. With that, we'll adjourn the meeting. And thank you, everybody, for your participation. Thank you, everyone. Stay safe.